This week, we'll be looking at social networks online. Our required reading this week was Chapter 3 of Jill Walker Retberg's book, Blogging, titled Blogs, Communities, and Networks. First, as a reminder, here's a summary of our assignments for this semester. Every week, please post one new entry on your blog. Thank you so much for the fine work you've done setting up your blogs. I'll provide feedback to each of you, and I look forward to seeing each of your blogs evolve during the weeks ahead. Next, please read your classmates' blogs and leave a comment where appropriate. Also, check the class syllabus and read the additional reading assignments. I'll send links to some articles throughout the semester. The midterm paper will be due on October 16. You'll be reviewing your classmates' blogs, writing a short one-paragraph review for each. I'll be sharing a lecture presentation with you all next week about online reviews and criticism, and hopefully that will give you some good guidance on how to proceed. After that, we'll have a guest post assignment due before November 13. You'll have to write a post for someone else's blog or website. It could be the blog of one of your classmates, it could be the website of one of your friends, or the place that you work. The point of the exercise is to highlight the writer-editor relationship. As online writers, for your own blogs, you are in total control of the content. You act as your own editors. By writing for someone else, you'll have to fit your content to someone else's voice. You'll copy me on what you submit to them, and then we'll see any changes they might make. Will they use your submission verbatim? How will they edit it? What will they add to it? Or how will they trim it? Finally, the final paper will be due on or before December 11. It will be a five-page paper, uh, the first half covering your thoughts on your experience as an online writer, and the second half covering your predictions for the future of online writing. If you have any questions about any of that, please don't hesitate to let me know. Now let's get rolling on social media. Retberg writes, Up until the 15th century, reading generally meant reading aloud. Often a reader would read for an audience. With silent reading, reading changed from a communal to a personal act. The solitude of reading and writing is perhaps changing with blogs, which are more explicitly social forms of writing. We saw the history of communication last week, and how online media have some characteristics of all the major forms of communication that preceded it oral, print, and mass electronic media. Online writing, with blogs as an example, has become part of the social fabric of the current media landscape. Repberg continues Instead of mass communication from a few producers to large, mostly passive audiences, Blogs support a dense network of small audiences and many producers. Software built to support such networks of social interactions is called social software. Thanks to current technology, we are all able to not only comment on the media messages we receive, but create and distribute our own media messages with the potential to receive nearly instant feedback from anyone, anywhere in the world, who might be equally connected to the World Wide Web. What we're seeing is an apparent expansion and affirmation of what has been called the public sphere. The public sphere is an area in social life where people can get together and freely discuss and identify societal problems and through that discussion influence political action. The public sphere is a concept introduced by Jürgen Habermas to describe an ideal democratic space for rational debate among informed and engaged citizens, a space that would thus be an arena mediating between state and society. The open debates that occur in such a public sphere are seen as necessary to a true democracy. Note that I said informed and engaged. For the ideal public sphere to exist, the public needs to have access to all the information that affects them and they need to be engaged to take action with that information. The emergence of radio and television have been blamed for the alleged decline in the public sphere. People no longer had to venture outside to gather information. It was broadcast to them. The passive nature of the mass media decreased the need to discuss important topics or ideas with others. 
It is argued that we became a world of couch potatoes, letting the powers that be dictate to us what news was important and what values and goals were worth pursuing. The flaw of traditional media is that the one-way, mass-broadcasting nature of radio and television, as well as mainstream print, publishing, made reasoning and debate between individuals almost impossible. We became passive consumers rather than fully informed and actively engaged citizens, unable to participate in the true public sphere. With the digital transformation, the internet and social media have created a new kind of public sphere. Chat rooms, online forums, interactive websites, comment-enabled blogs, social networks, and so on, now function in the same way as outdoor spaces did. While not a perfect replacement for actual person-to-person -person conversation, the real-time nature of cyberspace allows great conversation and debate to take place. Many scholars have discussed the relevance of the web and online writing to the concept of public sphere. While many people dispute the idea that the public sphere ever existed, the ideal that every person has a public voice is still open for debate. Did any of us actually have equal access in the marketplace of ideas? Or was it monopolized by who controlled the microphone? Who could scream the loudest? Who could stand in the highest soapbox? In places where the public sphere seemed to be most evident, Congress, courts of law, schools, and town hall meetings, those forums were not free-for-alls where anyone could speak. They were structured with certain hierarchies and protocols that included elected representatives, judges and lawyers, teachers with their curricula, and moderators who all controlled the flow of conversations. Are traditional media antisocial? According to Richard Sennett, the media have vastly increased the store of knowledge social groups have about each other, but have rendered actual contact unnecessary. Are traditional media undemocratic? Again, according to Richard Sennett, building on the tendency started by stage theaters and concert halls, traditional electronic media and even print media intensify crowd silence. You've got to be silent to be spoken to. Passivity is the logic of this technology. You have to be quiet and listen to receive and understand the messages that are being delivered to you via print and traditional mass electronic media. Reprog writes, today, audiences are anything but passive. And this has changed everything. It seems that the authority of blogs might not be tied simply to who can write them, which is anyone, but also to who can read them. Broad dissemination clearly worries many. Free dissemination means a lack of authority and ultimately a lack of control. And probably most importantly, a lack of profit. So are new media empowering? Some people see the internet as enabling new forms of community or democratic empowerment. The Arab Spring was a key example as people flocked to the streets against their governments and used Twitter and blogs to document their actions, spreading their messages throughout the world where mainstream media often were not able to keep up and didn't have the kind of access that those people did, causing a domino effect as others rose up to air their own grievances toppling one regime after another, thanks in part to the power of social media. On the flip side, are new media discriminatory? Are new media replacing one set of gatekeepers for another? Not everyone necessarily has equal access to the internet. The battles over net neutrality, for example, are evidence that different factions are trying to gain control of the distribution of information through digital media commercial and political interests are already creeping into the social media landscape. Social software that runs online social media is often centralized on a single server. We go to centralized sites such as Facebook, MySpace, Twitter, and so on to connect to users who are also on those sites. 
Some blogging sites are also centralized in this way. WordPress, Google's Blogger, Tumblr, LiveJournal, and so on. By centralized, I mean that the social network is maintained on their dedicated platform and servers. In the beginning, blogs were a relatively freeform type of social software and were decentralized, often running on their author's own domains and connecting haphazardly to other blogs. By decentralized, I mean that they were on their own domain. Decentralized is what blogs were originally meant to be, and now, more often than not, they are housed in centralized blogging platforms. They still link out to a vast network of blogs and sites outside their centralized homes, creating an enormous exoskeleton of connected networks. Links between blogs can be read by computers. Search engines and more specialized services such as Dig, Technorati, StumbleUpon, Google Analytics, etc. use them to trace the patterns and connections between blogs, drawing a map that shows sites that are frequently linked to as closer and stronger than sites that are more rarely linked. These services provide an exoskeleton for blogs, displaying a community between blogs that is not necessarily visible to a casual visitor. This community is also known as the blogosphere. Other online communities are gathered on a single site. YouTube, Flickr, Flickster, Open Salon, Goodreads, and so on and can thus immediately provide suggestions as to where friends or potential connections might be. These sites can be said to provide an intraskeleton for the social network. These centralized networks are more controlled. Mark Granovetter's theory of weak ties sums up social network theory as it applies online. Weak ties between individuals are more important than strong ties for the broad dissemination of information. In other words, weak ties are important because they work as bridges between social groups, giving them very early access to new information. Stanley Milgram and others conducted small world experiments following the theory that there are six degrees of connection or six degrees of separation between any two people in the world. Have you ever played the game Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, naming any actor in the history of movies and trying to see how many connections you can come up with before landing on actor Kevin Bacon? That's the idea at the root of social networks. The entire world is connected by six degrees or less. Name anyone in the world, the president, the pope, Tom Cruise, LeBron James, and within six degrees of separation, you know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows that person those weak ties those distant connects are more powerful than your direct connections I'll explain that in a little bit there are various ways we're connected to people in the real world often beyond our control we could be related to them we could live near them they might be our friends we might work with them Maybe there's someone we did business with years ago or someone we went to school with. It could be someone we barely know, but somehow we connected briefly. We might not really know them, but we happen to share some common bond. We could be the same nationality or ethnicity, the same religion or political affiliation. We might be in the same club, enjoying the same hobby or following the same sport. Those are just some of many examples of social network ties. Redbrook explains that social networks usually develop for other reasons than pure information gathering, such as family ties, a common job, or a shared neighborhood. Blogs, on the other hand, may exist primarily as networks for sharing ideas, trends, and information. So sites like Friendster and Facebook and LinkedIn and others sprouted up to take advantage of those natural connections. It was all based on the importance of weak ties, like I mentioned before. A closed network, as you see on the left, where A, B, and C all know each other equally well and have strong direct links to each other, 
will have difficulty getting new information unless there are weak links between some of the members of the network and a different network that has access to different information. In other words, we pretty much know just about everything our best friends know because we see them all the time, do practically everything together, talk to each other every day, and so on. It's those weak connections that they have, the person that we don't engage with every day, who might bring in something new, something we hadn't heard before, or know someone that we don't know, who can provide us with something we need that we weren't able to get directly through our direct connections. So those tight, direct connections might be protected and isolated. We're comfortable with each other, but we're also isolated, not receiving important new information. An open network, like you see on the right, that allows those weak link connections might have less control and run the risk of malignant or false information coming in, but positive messages also come in. The internet was designed as a distributed network where each computer is connected to a number of adjacent computers rather than to a single central hub. Such a network was thought to be more likely to remain functional in the case of an attack on it than a centralized network would be. In a centralized network, the entire network would go down if the central hub malfunctioned. The internet evolved into a distributed network where weak ties and social network theory um, was applied. Once information is attributed, it stood a good chance of being available to anyone throughout the network and endure as long as the distributed network is functional. The power of the network of blogs can be explained through visualizing the long tail of blogging. Most blogs only have a handful of blogs linking to them. Despite each of these blogs having only a handful of readers, all of them put together have more than the New York Times has readers or the BBC has viewers. While some individual blogs are more popular than others, the power of the network of blogs or the blogosphere is in their connections to each other through links, blog roles, viral videos, and ideas. You can see this better by turning the graph on its side. That long, seemingly tiny tail suddenly becomes a dynamo with the potential of far outpacing traditional media when it comes to impact and endurance. The power law of blogging states that blogs that already have power will get more. In the blogosphere, power often translates to links, since it is easier for search engines to measure links than actual readers. If you have a lot of other bloggers linking to you, your blog will be more easily found leading to more potential bloggers linking to your blog. I suppose you can compare this to a pyramid scheme. As long as you keep writing online, as, as long as you link to others and they link to you, your posts will gain more and more visibility and therefore reach more and more online readers. But unlike a pyramid scheme, even if you eventually stop blogging, some of your posts from the past might still live on and be discovered by new readers. This is accomplished through the power of links and keywords. In addition to allowing human readers to see and follow it, a link is machine readable. Search engines will recognize a link as a connection between blogs and interpret it as a recommendation. Google sees links as a kind of peer endorsement. The more links, the better. Other internet users must think the site is. It's, it's not a value judgment of good or bad, it's just a recognition that someone found the material worthy enough to link to it. So it appears in in case uh, others might find it valuable as well. If a writer tags his or her blog entry with a keyword, others searching for that keyword can more easily find that post. The recommendation is not an endorsement of quality or validity. It's just an acknowledgement that people are linking to it for whatever reason. Um, it's hard to measure actual eyeballs in any media. Dana Boyd, a sociologist and social networking researcher, identified four characteristics of online social spaces that distinguish them 
from their offline counterparts. Here they are, the four characteristics that make online public spaces different than the real world spaces. One, persistence. Information is recorded and can be accessed later. Even real-time conversations can leave an electronic footprint somewhere. Two, searchability. People can find you online. Three, replicability. Content can be copied and modified. Four, invisible audiences. You may not know exactly who is viewing your content. Those are the primary characteristics of online social spaces or publicly articulated relationships. Persistence, searchability, replicability, and invisible audiences. Online, it's all on a different scale from traditional media. Repberg says that blogs and the social publishing and communication forms that have developed on the web a part of a larger picture of communication and publishing through the ages. Blogs allow more dialogue than the pre-digital written word. Blogs allow even cheaper and more extensive distribution than print or broadcasting. Repberg says that blogs can be seen as belonging to the post-Gutenberg era a time after the dominance of print and of mass media. They use technologies first imagined by visionaries of hypertext, but are more social than even these visionaries imagined. We've seen social media evolve online and become an even greater means of communicating in our global society. From the early bulletin boards during the dawn of the internet to the development of sites such as Second Life and Twitter, New online social networks are emerging every day. Some, like DeviantArt, are topic-specific, while others, such as Foursquare, use GPS technology um, to uh, gather geography-based check-ins and other features. Google Plus offers controlling circles, categorizing social connections. Meetup markets to specific needs. Ning offers a little bit of everything, video chat, message boards, file sharing, blogging, and so on, while Pinterest and Instagram focus on visual content. What will the future hold? Where do we go from here? Those are some of the things to think about as we use online media to communicate about everything in our professional and business lives. Let me know what your experiences are with social media. What do you think? What are the good aspects and the negative aspects? Again, where do you think we go from here?